trap right there. Now. He got him. From Baltimore to Los Angeles, and from Texas to Ohio. Over the last year, shocking images of American police brutalizing and killing black people have left the world and me in disbelief. It was a homicide. That was cold-blooded murder. And sparked some of the worst civil disorder seen in America in decades. The hostility, the anger in the community, it's still gonna be out there. I don't wanna wake up every day feeling like I'm gonna get killed by a police. But they've also galvanized a new generation of young activists demanding an end to police brutality. What do you actually want, though? I want my little brother to be able to walk down the street without being stopped and racially profiled. The shooting of an unarmed black teenager in Ferguson, a small town in Missouri, last year lit a fire that's still raging in the hearts of African Americans. Does anybody in this shop call the police when they need help now? No. Like, you gotta, yes sir, no sir, them just so they can treat you right. So one year on, I've come here to meet the young people who found a new voice. And that was my first experience with tear gas. I want to see how the community's been affected. I think people want to bring down America. How the next generation of cops are being trained. You gonna shoot me, is that what you're doing? In the back of their mind, they have to have a backup plan to kill everybody in the car. And discover how the system still discriminates against African Americans. The police uh, operate for profit. That can't possibly be anything except a relationship of distrust. In a small town, that will never be the same. If you don't like white people and you don't like black people, move out of Ferguson. America is a place I know and love. But I've been shocked like the rest of the world by the disturbing images of young African Americans being beaten up or killed that have flooded the internet over the last year. As a black man, I can't help feeling that if I lived here, it could have been me. I am not dressed for this weather. And the cold, hard facts bear this out. Young black men are 21 times as likely to be killed by police as white men of the same age. On first impressions, Ferguson, Missouri, in the heart of America's Bible Belt, Looks like the type of sleepy town where not much happens. A fire station, a police station, over 30 churches and lots of flags. But on the main street, there's still plenty of evidence of the unrest that rocked the town following the fatal shooting on August 9th, 2014 of Michael Brown, a black teenager shot by a white cop. 17-year-old school student Clifton Kinney was caught up in the events that would bring Ferguson to worldwide attention. Hey, you must be Reggie. <laughs> yeah, how you doing, brother? Nice doing to meet you. Doing great, nice to meet you. What are you eating? I'm eating a bacon, egg, and cheese. All right. This is the uh, Ferguson Burger Bar. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty famous place now. Oh, why is it so famous? Um, it's famous because when all of the restaurants had boarded up the windows in fear of, you know, the protests, in fear of the riots. Uh, Mr. Charles Davis, the owner of the Ferguson Burger Bar, he kept his restaurant open. Is this Mr. Charles Davis here? Yes, this is him. Hello, sir. How you doing? You all right? I think we should get out there right now. I want to show you West Florissant. I want to show you Ground Zero. Okay, let's do it. Don't forget your phone. Nice to meet you, sir. Take care. Clifton wants to show me where Brown was shot. Let's take a walk. Okay. It was on this street around noon, 18-year-old Michael Brown was recorded allegedly stealing cigars from a local gas station. We're heading this way? We're heading this oh. way. Ten minutes later, Brown and his friend Dorian Johnson are spotted walking down the middle of Canfield Drive by Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson. There's an altercation between the two men. Wilson fires repeatedly. Six bullets hit Brown in the chest, forehead and arm. Dorian Johnson, Brown's friend, claimed Michael had his hands up but according to the official inquiry, no other credible witnesses could verify this. And with no video evidence, we'll never know exactly what happened between the two men. But even the police agree, Michael Brown was unarmed. On August 9th, I drove out here. I parked my car by the quick trip and I walked down. And as I began to walk closer down that sidewalk, I was over there. 
I began to see his body. And at first I stopped, I'm like, holy shit. Goodbye. Live from first, and they just killed this nigga for no reason. And you can see the blood flowing. His mother is out there crying and screaming. Then you see the police, you saw the dogs. The community is just trying to figure out what's going on, right? The police are already over aggressive. Kids are crying, trying to figure out why is Mike Mike laying in the ground? What happened to Mike? Mike Brown was out in the street for about four hours? Four hours. That's four hours lying dead on the tarmac, in full view of his family and friends. He was a kid. He was a kid. I'm 18 now. I'm supposed to go to college. He was 18. He was supposed to go to college. And just trying to figure out why, you know, why? Why did you kill him? It isn't long before local news picked up what happened here. A very hostile breaking news situation. There is outrage tonight from those reacting to a Ferguson police officer. A developing story this morning. A local 18-year-old is shot and killed by police in Ferguson. No no Hours later, upset neighbors flooded the streets of Ferguson. Angry protesters marched to the front door of the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department demanding answers. Everything they're doing to us is wrong. As word of the shooting spreads, more people take to the streets. Armed with placards, Clifton and his friends join the protests. During those early days of protest, I would be a protester by night and a student by day. Uh, I would, <laughs> seriously, I would get out of school at 3 p.m., protest all the way up to 5.30 a.m., and we just hit the ground running. We started reaching out to students from different schools, from uh, McClure North, from Hazelwood East, from Hazelwood Central, we, and we began organizing. You need to get out of the street immediately. You must disperse now. More protests tonight in a St. Louis suburb. This area will be clear. As the days go on, the demos and protests grow in size and scale. So does the police presence. This is the famous Ground Zero police line up here, standing against us. When we hear that siren, that means that tear gas is coming. Violent clashes break out. There are reports of looting, and this is now no longer a local news story. Heavy reinforcements have just arrived at the city hall. A police car just beyond where I'm speaking now has been set on fire. Burn that motherfucker down. Several of these businesses were looted. And that was my first experience with tear gas and rubber bullets. It was unreal. I had no idea how to cover myself or protect myself from tear gas. You know, it, it was- Why should you? And, right, why should I know? And not only am I 17, it shouldn't happen. As flames and fury fill the air, over 2,000 National Guard soldiers flood the streets of Ferguson to subdue the protests and protesters like Clifton. There's nothing wrong with someone standing in the street saying, hands up, don't shoot, right? There's nothing violent about that. Hands up, don't shoot quickly becomes the rallying cry against the use of excessive force by police on African-American people all across the United States. Hands up, don't shoot! Hands up, don't shoot! And when a grand jury decides not to charge Officer Darren Wilson, protests spread to more than 90 cities across America. Nearly a year later, there are still demonstrations going on outside the Ferguson police station. But it's not quite what I was expecting. This rally is in support of Officer Wilson and all law enforcement officers, or Leos, as their supporters affectionately call them. What's that you got there in your hand? Was that on the side of the car? I had this magnet. Yeah, I'm putting it back. OK. I had it made, not even on my truck. We want to just stand up and tell them we're here. We support you, that you risk your lives for us, because it ain't about racial thing, it ain't about you're wrong, we're right. We stand up for what we believe, and that's it. But it's impossible to ignore race in a place like Ferguson. This is a town that is 70% black, but when Brown was shot, only three out of 53 police officers were African American. And I can't help noticing that everyone here today is white. Did you make these yourself? No, I have them ordered. And what do these say? We support you and the uh, law enforcement officer. LEO, we support you. Got you. Right. 
And are you paying for these yourself? I am. How much oh, do you I spend know. on a weekly basis then doing this? Well, I usually spend about 250 to 300 each Raleigh. You know, to see a smile when you walk in there unexpected, uh, it's worth it. Yeah. Money can't buy that. Tell me a bit about your bracelets. I oh, thought you there's got to be something that we can sell at the rallies, and it was the biggest oh, profit of items that we How sold. How much do you think you made just from the bracelets um, alone? Close to $7,000 from the bracelets. And what is the date on the uh, T-shirt? It's the, the date that the, uh, Michael Brown was um, shot. Right. So uh, how much money were you able to, uh, to raise for Darren Wilson? Well, um, uh, almost close to, I believe it was close to a million dollars with all the sales of... Close to a million dollars? Hats and... Randy, will you grab those tomatoes? Wow. When so many people in this town still question the verdict, that is some retirement fund. But these guys aren't just defending one police officer. It seems like they're protecting a way of life and using every available tool. How many people are, uh, are watching your stream right now? I've got 85 viewers right now. And this is, this is live? This is going out online right now? This is live, going out all over the world. Right now I'm talking with the BBC and uh, they, they are a great group of people. Yeah. That woman over there has a sign that says, the war on police officers must end. What do you think that she means by that? There, I do feel that there's a war on police. I feel that it's a proxy. Uh, they're using police as a proxy to, to wage um, a war of ideals. I think people want to bring down America. What people want to bring down America? The radical left. Do you mean the people that support my Brown? Yeah. I, I support and defend the Constitution. And I feel that everyone has the right to express their First Amendment right. And you seem to be struggling with what it is you want to say. Is it, is it what you're saying is a, it's, it's, it's tough to say? Or are you worried they might make me feel uncomfortable? It's hard for me to say this because if I talk about it in America, then I'm automatically stereotyped as a racist. And if I talk about myself being a white man, uh, then it makes, it makes me feel very uncomfortable. A society can only take so much pressure and tension until things unravel. But then, to my surprise, it turns out not everybody who supports Darren Wilson here is white. Excuse me, do you mind if I bend your ear for a second? How you doing? I'm Reggie. How you doing, Chris? Chris, mm. it's hard to ignore the fact that you are the only black guy here. Yeah. It's pretty <laughs> obvious. You kind of stand out, Chris. Yeah. Um, why do you think it is that you're the only African-American here? Because uh, not all of them see the truth that I do. And what is it that you we'll see? Wait until he's finished. That this whole thing ain't about race. You know, it's right, wrong. And like I said, it's about police doing what they need to do and protecting innocent people. So you think everyone that supports Mike Brown is a criminal? Not everybody. But I mean, I don't understand why you'd support somebody who robs a gas station. It was unfortunate what happened to Mike Brown, but at the same time, he did break the law. And Officer Wilson did what he needed to do. What's that you've got in your waistband? This? Oh. No, that. <laughs> That's my 45. You've brought a gun with you today? Mm -hmm. Why have you brought a gun down? I guess I'll take it everywhere I go. A lot of us carry. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, a lot of people here are carrying. How many people would you say here are actually carrying weapons? About just about everybody. And why is that? What is it that you're worried about? Well, when in the past we've had protesters that have been pretty aggressive towards us. They come in, they get in our faces and they yell and um, they push us and you know, you just can't. I'm a female, and I need to protect myself. Are you carrying a weapon? Absolutely. Yourself? What do you What do you have on you? I have a 380. And that's loaded. It's loaded. Absolutely. Talking with these almost entirely white citizens, I can't help wondering what the black community must make of a demo like this. And I'm about to find out. Watch out, man. Two young men have come across the road and one of them is filming everything. Excuse me, what are you, uh, what are you filming for today, bro? Huh? I'm just interested, I'm just trying to find out what it is you're, you're filming for. Okay, excuse me, you're, uh, you're walking around doing a similar thing 
uh, to myself, you're, uh, you're, you're asking questions and, and filming it as well. What's your name? My name is Frankie Edwards. Reggie, nice to meet you, nice man. To meet nice you, to bro. meet you. Are you, uh, you from Ferguson? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Okay, so what was the reason for you coming down here today to talk to people? Oh, uh, well, the reason why I came down here, I was just riding paths going to my house, and I seen people out here with the flags and things. I, I just wondered what they was doing. What, what sort of reaction are you getting? Well, the reaction I'm getting is like a little negative reaction, for real. Mm. Like they question about a, a shirt and everything. Once but you see, it say, in peace and solidarity and everything. We gave, we made like 7,000 of these shirts and gave them all away for free. And it had the multicolored fits on it, mm. meaning that we need to come together as a people. Not just as this race and this race, but as a whole. What do you think that this rally um, is, is stirring up within the community here? We all live in the same community, but we are not speaking to each other. We're not waving to each other. We, it's just, it's like it's, it's segregation already in Ferguson. We need change, we need change. Like, I don't want to wake up every day feeling like I'm gonna get killed by a police or get killed by somebody in the streets. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want that. I got two kids and that's and that's one thing we gotta work on. But realistically, what do you think the chances are of people being able to work together and talk together? Because at the moment, being really honest, this young man has come here and through him talking to me and people hearing what he's had to say, the conversation has begun. I had a grandfather and an uncle that both died in the line of duty and um, I came to sport, but also to walk in love. I want truth, justice, and peace. I want police to be respected. I want people to be respected. I meant white people to be respected and black people. People like him and me, I don't have to hang out with you, but I have to respect you. But we don't have to agree about everything, but we got to work together. Yes, and I said at the city council meeting, if you don't like white people and you don't like black people, move out of Ferguson. Uh, thanks for coming out, showing support for the officers. Listening to some of these folks talk makes me realize that perhaps things here aren't as black and white as first appeared. One of the most interesting things is that they were all saying the same thing. We need to communicate, we need to talk, we need to reach out, we need to have a dialogue. But in the moment, nobody wanted it because there was this fear that existed the minute they saw him come over. It was even funny when I was talking to the, um, the, the young black guy who was wearing the I am Darren Wilson bracelet, the minute he saw the two of them, he went, oh, here we go expecting there to be problems. And that's a black man looking at another black man. This is so nuanced and this is so, so difficult to boil down that to look at it in, in simple sort of bullet pointed terms is the most negative thing I think you can do because conversations are needed. This isn't about placards, this is about people. It's a mere 15 minutes drive from Ferguson to downtown St. Louis, the capital city of Missouri. But whilst the center of the city feels racially diverse and at ease with itself, when you head out to the suburbs like Ferguson, you hit neighborhoods that are almost entirely black and poor as well. One in five households live below the poverty line and home ownership is almost half that of the white community. I can't help feeling this inequality was as much a reason for the anger and frustration of the protests that exploded here. But amongst the boarded up businesses, at least someone is trying to improve the battered image of Ferguson. Hello. 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 How are you? Uh, I'm very good, thank you. Hi, I'm Reggie. Hi, Reggie. I'm Dorothy Kaiser. Lovely Welcome to, to I Love Ferguson. Is this your store? Actually, I am a volunteer. We're all volunteers at this store. Okay, and how long have you, uh, how, how long have you been here? I mean, in fact, how long has this store actually been here? Well, actually, we opened the I Love Ferguson right after the Michael Brown incident. Do you mind showing me around the store, I'd maybe? I'd, I'd love to see what you've I'd got in there. I'd be happy to. It started out with a couple of the shirts, and it just sort of took off. Yeah, so there's So all of these items. Mugs. Mugs. Hats as well. And there were actually 10,000 of these yard signs. What do you think it was that, that caused the riots? You know, it's always right, wrong type thing. This happened to be an African-American who was walking in the middle of the street, which he should not have been. There was an officer that came involved, and an ins the shooting happened. What all took place before that ever happened, only those two people will know. I do believe that the policeman has to protect himself in order to protect 
someone else who is in danger. Mm -hmm. So if, if he's not there to protect us, then we have anarchy. So when this all kicked off here in Ferguson, was you angry that this was happening in your town? Oh. <laughs> uh, yes, I was very unhappy. You know, we have one police killing in the history of Ferguson, you know, and then for one incident, all these people all of a sudden are here from 30 different states within 24 hours. You know, they, they threw the Molotov cocktails in and burned, de literally destroyed the yeah. businesses. And what good did it do? People have a right to voice their opinion, but you don't, you don't have to destroy and take somebody else's things away to prove your point, do you? Were you afraid at any point when yes. that's what happened? Yes, yes. When, when my house was within a mile of where the Little Caesars was burned out, I thought, oh my gosh, they're getting close to my house. I did think, gosh, if something happens, I need some protection. And the only thing I could think of was my husband had one of the long-handled barbecue forks, and I thought, I think I kind of had that under my bed in case somebody came in. Mm. <laughs> so how do you feel uh, about Ferguson now, off the back of um, everything that's gone on? This is my town. You know, don't do this. My husband and I raised three children in this community, but you know what? We taught them, you follow the rules, you break the rule, you pay the penalties. To be fair to Dorothy and the lady in the shop, what they were saying was completely honest. That is how they feel, and the way that they feel isn't based on anything other than their own experiences. And that doesn't make them bad people. That just makes them honest to their environment and to their way of life. There is definitely some truth in, you know, if you don't break the law, you don't get in trouble with the police. But unfortunately, when your skin is this color or darker, that isn't necessarily always the case. Um, there seems to be a level of suspicion placed upon people who are of African-American descent. And that suspicion can lead to justification of all manner of things, from being stopped by the police or, or being harassed in the street. Literally across the road is Kathy's Kitchen, a black-owned business that stayed open and provided a refuge for the protesters during the riots. Chef James has lived here all his life, and raised a family in Ferguson. I mean, where do you stand on the real situation here on the ground and what it really means to be African-American? If you do not live in my community, if you do not ride with me in my car, if you don't walk down my streets, then you don't know what happens on my streets. You don't know what happens when I'm riding in my car. My youngest daughter graduates high school tomorrow. Congratulations. You know, and I'm so proud of her. <laughs> wow. But I was taking her to UMSL University where she's been accepted for a full scholarship for four years. And we were pulled over. I pulled over, my truck is legal, my license is valid and everything. And the officer asked me to step out the car and I asked him for what reason am I, am I exiting my vehicle? And he said, well, it's routine. I said, it's not routine. I said, well, first of all, I'm not getting out of the car. I'm 45 years old. I got bad knees from playing basketball when I was young and I'm not sitting on no curb. It's not gonna happen. I caused no threat. I don't carry any weapons. I say, I'll give you my license, I'll give you my vehicle registration, and I'll give you my attorney's card. And you can have those three. It's not about what he did to me, it's the fact that you tried to embarrass me in front of my child. You know, you wanted to degrade me and put me in a position of sitting on the side of the curb and things of that nature when it was unnecessary. My heart and my prayers go to Mike Brown and his family and anyone's family who's, who feel that they've been subjected to the similar or, or same type of situation. When the, um, the verdict was given on, uh, on Darren Wilson and you know, no criminal charges were raised, how did you react? To me, everything was like a design plan. They already knew before they even started that he was gonna be found not guilty. The way history has shown me in cases similar to this, that's the verdict. Do you believe that if another black man is killed by a police officer, things will only get worse? And it's if he's by... innocent and it, the the excessive force is too much, then yes, it's a powder keg. In the years since Michael Brown's death, there have been a mounting number of incidents involving excessive use of force by police on African Americans. Do not touch me! Do not touch me! A pregnant woman in California thrown to the ground for allegedly resisting arrest. 
Get out of the car! And a woman in Texas forcibly removed from her car for failing to indicate while changing lanes. Get over there! With these sorts of incidents increasingly being caught on camera, the police officers in each of these cases have been subsequently disciplined or charged. With the help of social media spreading these shocking images to millions, I can't be alone in seeing a very obvious pattern. The police officers are all white and the victims all black. So when in April this year, a young African-American Freddie Gray dies in police custody, Baltimore erupts. Our top story is breaking right now in Baltimore, where rioting has broken out in the street. Once more, the National Guard is called in, and this time, a six-day curfew is imposed. The rioting inevitably gets the headlines, but the statistics behind them do not. So far this year, 176 black people have died at the hands of American police officers and five of those have been in Missouri alone. In Ferguson, Officer Darren Wilson is still in hiding, but accusations of racial bias and profiling against the police won't go away. So I can't believe my luck when I'm invited to see how they train their next generation of cops. Uh, at the moment, I'm just trying to navigate this huge truck of a thing that I'm driving around this parking lot. And um, I think I've just pulled a massive illegal manoeuvre in front of a bunch of police officers. So uh, <laughs> I might not get to see anything. I might end up in a jail cell. Hey. <laughs> this might be a chance for me to see this story from the other side, experiencing what the police might be up against. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm very good, thank Eric you. Eric Osterman, very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you, and that's a very firm handshake. Thank you. Jesus, wow. <laughs> nice to meet you. Are you involved in the training today? Yes, sir. Come on down. We're going to get shot up. Oh, so man, okay. The idea is for us to get shot, because we're going to be the bad guys, not, not for them to get shot. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, good morning, guys. With the local force in the national spotlight, it's hard to ignore the nerves in the room. Good morning, guys. All right, guys, so let's talk a little bit about what's going to happen for your simunitions role play day. You guys have had a bunch of role plays, right? Situational stuff. You have to make decisions, act appropriately. Today is no different. The only difference is we're going to put a mask on you, and instead of carrying a plastic blue gun, you're going to have a simunitions gun. A bullet on it has a little paint tip. It's designed to hit you and hurt, so there's a penalty for um, inaccurate decisions. Everybody clear on that? Yes, sir. Okay. This is like your exams at school turned up to 20. This is mental. It's a lot of pressure. The rookie cops are in the final weeks of their training. Today, they're up against their instructors, playing the bad guys and armed to the teeth with paint guns. You got a gun selected yet? But first, they're checked for real ones. Might be down there. Do you get patted down just in case? Just in case we have our one sim gun. Didn't even consider the fact that they uh, usually carry weapons, therefore they have to be checked just in case they're carrying one of their weapons with live rounds in it. Um, yeah, suddenly I'm feeling a little nervous for the guys in there. My singing voice would So what kind of scenario would require this level of firepower? A hostage siege? A bank robbery? No. It turns out to be a traffic stop. As a police officer, when they make a traffic stop, they have to think, when I walk up to that car, I have to be professional, I have to be courteous, I have to know that what I'm stopping this person for was the right reason for stopping them. And then in the back of their mind, they have to have a backup plan to kill everybody in the car if need be. Nobody else has to think that way. I wasn't sure if the lieutenant was joking or deadly serious, but it's time for the first exercise. Here we go. Put your hands on the why are we even being stopped? Why are, why'd you stop us? I'm sorry, I can't hear you because the radio's turned on. Turn down the radio. Oh, sorry. Oh, you got your hand on your gun, you're going to shoot me? Okay. You're going to shoot me? Is that what you're doing? And what appears to be a routine altercation suddenly turns into something else altogether. Get down on the ground! Get down on the ground! Run! 
that was like the most real game of cops and robbers I think I've ever seen. Standing in my position, it's actually quite fun to watch to see how they deal with it, but they're dealing with some real issues there. You've got people in the car doing what I've done, questioning authority, answering back. Obviously, I've never driven around with a gun and shot at police, but just watching this scenario play out, you can see how the police might act a little bit paranoid, particularly over here, as people carry guns. This could very easily happen in real life. Nevertheless, in 2014, the city of Ferguson spent four times more money on police uniforms than they did on police training. I'm uh, watching these training scenarios play out and they're quite different every single time. It sort of makes me think about what may or may not have happened with Darren Wilson and yes. with, with Mike Brown. I mean, how does that compare to what we're seeing today? Um, well, in, in anything you do in law enforcement, there could be 20 ways to do this right. Would the uh, outcome have been the same? We don't know. Mm. I mean, nobody really knows. Every officer has to find their own way. I, I have to ask, race is a, obviously an uncomfortable, is this an uncomfortable conversation to have, particularly at this moment in time? One of the accusations that seems to be thrown around a lot is that the police force are endemically racist. I mean, how do you, how do you respond to, to that kind of accusation? Pointing a finger and just saying, the police are racist, that's just a lazy argument. Mm. There, there are so many things. Yeah, do we, do we need to change some of the things we do? Sure, and we will. Mm. But just saying they need more training and uh, they're racist, that's the laziest argument there is. There's a lot more problems out there than just that. But the reality is that in one year alone, out of the 11,000 people stopped for traffic violations in Ferguson, nine out of 10 of them were African Americans. And although these training exercises are colorblind, they still assume that the people they stop will be armed and dangerous. So in a town that is 70% African American, this driver would most likely be a black man and quite possibly dead. Run! Did you get shot? Yeah, right in the face. Listen, in the face? He caught me right there with the first shot. Oh my God, um, wow. How did they do? So they did fantastic, uh, in my opinion. They did very well. Yeah. Yep. Before you take your mask off, everyone holstered. The last pair nervously waiting their turn are rookie cops Roy and Peter. You just get the cuffs on him, he's too close. Yeah, he's in a really bad position yeah, there, right? With someone behind him. How do you feel about the uh, perceptions of the police department here in Ferguson? Because obviously, if you graduate, you will be seen as just this badge yeah. and this gun. Yeah. Um, are you ready for that? Each and every one of us knew what we were getting into. You know, it wasn't a surprise. It wasn't like January 5th we came here and January 6th Ferguson happened and we're like, oh, uh-oh, what are we going to do now? Everyone should have already had that in the back of their mind that at some point they're going to have to be involved in this situation. I mean, the hostility, the anger in the community, it's still going to be out there. And our job as law enforcement is to protect the public. Uh, but the people that you are serving currently, well, a large chunk of them aren't necessarily um, your biggest fans right now. You can't go about doing your job, um, you know, picking out a certain, a certain race or a certain demographic, black, white, Asian. I mean, it doesn't matter. There's laws out there to be enforced. It all comes to trust, you know. Uh, we have to build the trust. I think it's going to take a while. Gonna Come on. Yeah. Who's contact? Who's covered? Let me contact. Who's Go. Covered? Go get him. Hey, mask up, Hey. Hey, sir, stop. I'm sure these rookies want to do their job as best they can, but in the current atmosphere of so much anti-police feeling, I wonder how possible that really is. Hey, driver's got a gun. The reality is that of these 19 young recruits, some of them could get fatally shot in the field. This isn't an easy job. I do have massive hope for them that they're gonna do the right thing the minute they get that power that is given when you have a badge and you have a gun. But who knows? In 2013 in Ferguson, out of 5,384 traffic stops, 4,632 were African Americans. What puzzles me is just why so many people are being pulled over in the first place. To find out, I'm meeting Brendan Rodiger, 
a political activist and human rights lawyer. The officers may look quite corporate, but he's protested on the streets of Ferguson himself and is still dealing with the cases of those arrested during the protests. This looks like the right place. Brendan. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Rodrigo. Good to see you. Good to see you. Should I sit here? Yeah, wherever you want, man. <laughs> this is a, it's a little unnerving <laughs> sitting in a, in a legal office. I feel like I should have some problems. From your point of view, what is the relationship between the police and young black men and women? It's a relationship of distrust. Um, it's a relationship that really couldn't be anything except distrust. The police are out on the streets, and a part of what they're doing is just looking for ways to begin interactions with people, to give them citations, and ultimately to get money out of them. Many of these municipal budgets are based upon fining the residents of the municipality, up to 60% of the budget. Up to 60? So the police uh, operate for profit. Right, and, and those fines are primarily coming from what? From traffic fines? Well, traffic fines, but also increasingly other um, sagging pants violation. That's, that's a crime. Manner of walking violation. No, you can't go no, over that. No, is that, is that a crime serious. in certain so municipalities? Oh yeah, absolutely. And what's the fine for sagging pants? Uh, $200 would be a, a regular fine. Anytime that there's a group of young black men walking down the street, they can issue a manner of walking citation. That's unbelievable. So, you know, there's that level of distrust. As a legal aid lawyer, Brendan's bread and butter work is defending poor people on minor offences in court. I'm going to ride along with him to find out just who these people are and what they're accused of. Do you know, just walking on the street with you right now is making me think about the, um, the pants sagging law because technically right now, oh, yeah. I'm sagging. Oh yeah. So would I have been yeah, you'd be arrested in... or fined for that? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then if you missed your court date because you didn't have enough money to make the payment, you'd go to jail. For this? Yeah, yeah. Until you came up with the cash to buy your way out of jail. Wow. Yeah. That's really That's why really I don't scary. say it. <laughs> well, luckily, I'm from the UK, so say it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think the system has been set up in a, in a certain way to take advantage of African Americans? Well, I'm from the very beginning of this country, it was designed to take advantage of African Americans. So there are just changing ways of doing this. Because we have, in St. Louis County, we have, we have 90 municipalities. 90. And just to, just to break that down for you, that would mean that there's 90 police forces, 90 different some of them fire share, departments. Some of them share some of those. So there's, I, I think currently there are 56 police departments. Wow. Okay, so um, can you explain to me just how that affects the courts. There, are, we, we talk about there are 90 cities, towns, villages, um, and 83 or 84 of them, depending on the week, have their own court. And those courts are all part time; there are no full time. Uh, that means the judge comes out to city hall or to the police station or to the high school gymnasium or you know wherever court is held, once a month, twice a month, and they have a giant what we call docket. Oftentimes there will be three, four hundred people on a docket. And these are all different cases that they have all to All different with. cases, right. but all minor. No, okay. no serious, no serious cases. High grass, speeding, driving with a suspended license, sagging pants, that sort of stuff. And it's very common to go to a town that is 88, 90% African American. The judge is white, the prosecutor is white, the clerk is white, every police officer in the, in the room is white, and every defendant is black. And so it looks, you know, it looks like apartheid South Africa. It sounds like an exaggeration, but that, the optics, that's what it looks like. So is this the, the court? It's the middle school just over here on the left? This is the court. And it's in a middle school. Yeah. And the lot looks pretty full. Yeah, hundreds. So who is it you're representing today? So I'm representing a young man who's sort of a classic story. The, the way this usually works is People start off with a driver's license, they start off with a, with a title in their car, and everything's good, and then they get pulled over, usually for speeding or something minor, and you'll get a fine, and the fine is, let's say, $200. If you don't make the payment, two things happen. You get a warrant, so next time you get pulled over, you're gonna get arrested, and your driver's license gets automatically suspended. So now, it's a week later, and you're driving, and let's say you blow a red light, you go through a red light, you get pulled over, you're in a different town, you're gonna get a ticket for that red light, you're gonna get a ticket for driving while suspended, and you're gonna get taken to jail. And once you bond out of that jail, you're gonna get taken to the jail that initially gave you 
the warrant. You probably owe 600 to $1,000, and you've got a new court date to make a payment. And the chances are you're not gonna have that money. And so it just spirals. I have clients that owe $5,000 to these courts and who spend on the installment plan months in jail. Well, it's almost I mean, like, it's like a bad joke. Right. And the people at the butt of the joke are poor African-Americans. Right, and your girlfriend doesn't have the money and you don't know if you'll ever get out. And if you already suffer from depression, you know, how does, how does that end? I mean, that's where it stops being funny. So will this young man actually be in court today or is it just you no, here he will on his not. behalf? he will not. Once you have a lawyer, you don't even have to, you don't even have to come. And all of the people that are in there on their own right now are people who do not have lawyers. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right, well, pleasure to meet you, and thank you so much for clearing so many things up. Um, best of luck with the call. Thank you. And sure enough, every single person who turns up over the next 10 minutes is black. You know, so, so many people have told me that if you, um, if you commit a crime, you should be punished for it. But it would appear that the only people that commit crimes here are black people. <laughs> it seems incredible to me that in a country with a black president, this type of racial bias has been allowed to go unchecked for so long. I'm meeting up with 17-year-old oh, activist okay. Clifton again. Yeah, there, man. You're right. Good to see it's you. time for a haircut. Let's get in. And a chat with his friends to see whether they think anything has changed. How are you doing, man? This is my bro, Reggie. How you doing? My guy, Reggie. How you doing? You all right? Yeah, very good, thank you. Very good. You want me looking after me? Yeah, yeah. All right. I need help. I'm in desperate need of a trim. So what are you getting? Can I keep the level on top? And can you taper the front for me as well? Thank you very much. You know, I wanted to find out how how the people on the ground coped with and dealt with the situation off the back of, you know, the death of, a, of an unarmed black man. Where do the American police, with their arms, fit into the, the problem? When race and power collide, you have an issue. You know, in, in, in Baltimore, St. Louis, Staten Island, each city has its own issues with the police. So each, each situation is different. But I think it's becoming a power problem. Police have to change the way they go about doing things. Does anybody in the shop call the police when they need help now? No. They pull up like they like you below them. Like you gotta yes sir, no sir them just so they can treat you right, which is wrong. Not all police officers are bad, but a lot of them do abuse their authority. Obviously here, you know, guns are legal. Uh, Law-abiding citizens have them and criminals have them. Just how safe do you feel? I don't feel safe because you never know when somebody might feel like they want to come kick your door and because they may be lacking something or they may be high for something. On Every day somebody's house is getting broken into. Yeah. Every day. And it's happening. Yeah. If I could show you at least 20, 30, 40 children that have guns, and I know they don't have uh, permits for these. Do many kids your age have guns? Yeah. Because of rap and all that, they want to have a gun. Because it is cliche, you know. Mm -hmm. The kid from the inner city gets a gun to look cool in front of his friends. Right? I mean, and it's, it's the sort of thing that you, you hate mass media saying about black people. Yeah. I know I feel that way regardless of where they are in the world. Right. But mm -hmm. essentially you're saying that that is the case. So is that what's going on here? Or have I got it completely wrong? No, I think it's a, it's a deeper issue. If you look at the fact that all of these guns in the hood are easier to get more than it is easier for someone to go register to vote, um, more easier than it is for a child to get better access to higher education, there's a huge systemic issue. Instead of having a gun in my home, I want to look for solutions. Everybody has a right to bear arms in their home. Why do you believe that? Because you never know what anything can happen. In this day and age that we live in, man, you never know what can happen, man. The idea of having a gun at home isn't one that, you know, I, it doesn't sit well with me. I mean, you've got a gun to protect your family, but at the same time, the criminals have guns. Somebody come to your house got a gun and you don't have any weapons in your house, you might as well just lay down. I think would you rather lay down or would you rather fight? I'd rather fight for mine. Hey, you need a gun. If I was living here and had a family, maybe I'd feel the same. The trouble is, if the police assume that every black guy they stop is potentially armed, the chances of more people being shot increases. Racial profiling plus millions and millions of freely available firearms is a bad mix for everybody. And this is a country that allows its citizens the right to bear arms. 
280 million guns. That's almost one for every person in America. But my sound recordist and driver, both local guys, don't see it as a problem at all. I have two shotguns, I have no handguns. I've always had shotguns. I've always hunted. I love handguns. I've seen a lot of cool looking guns. Right. And of course, they're presented as cool. You know, I mean, like you might say, okay, philosophically, they're not cool. You know, I don't like guns. But I'm saying, it's like as motorcycles, it's cool, it's powerful. Every man needs a thing. And the fact that you're able to legally own one, you know. But the thing, the difference is, I think, when you're a kid in the UK, they're almost not real. <laughs> right. You know, they're little plastic things that you run around the playground with. Right. And you never think at any point, oh, wouldn't it be great to have one of these for real? You know? Yeah, no. And I, that's, that's the I'm difference. I mean, with that. I think if you have the access to it, it becomes the motorbike. It becomes the fast car. Uh, you know what? I think that's fair. I have to agree with you there. What I don't agree with is um, um, being able to drink in your country at 18. <laughs> uh, that just blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ultimate Defense is one of the biggest licensed gun stores in St. Louis. I want to find out if the events of Ferguson had an effect on gun buying habits here. Hello. Hi. Hey, how you doing, Welcome Reggie? Welcome to Defense. I'm Paul. Uh, nice to meet you, Paul. Good to meet you too. Uh, is this is this your business? This is my business. This right. is it. Indoor firing range. We do retail to gun sales. We do a lot of training here as well. Okay. Wow. So uh, I guess that means that these are for sale. Would that be right? Correct. Yes. So wow. we carry 400 guns in stock. We don't carry the low line guns. So we're very looking, very, very much looking for a, a specific clientele. What sort of price range would a low line gun be? Low line guns would be in a 200 to 250 dollar range. You can get a gun for 200, legally get a gun for 200 quid. You can. Wow, okay. Handguns are one thing, but you've got these big monsters in the back here. I do. Um, what is that? That is a 12 gauge shotgun, um, home defense specialty. Uh, it's interesting that you refer to it as a home defense specialty. Um, do you find a lot of people come here to buy guns, particularly for the purpose of defending their homes? To, uh, yeah. One well, of the events that happened in Ferguson, everybody got pulled into a specific area and it left areas short on law enforcement coverage. As a result of that, have you seen more people buy guns? Absolutely, yeah, we had a huge, tremendous spike in sales. It's not a bad idea to have the ability to defend yourself. Yeah. In the four months after the Ferguson riots, gun sales in this shop alone went up by 84% compared to the previous year. And according to Paul, four out of five of his customers are white. But the irony is, black people are far more likely to be killed by a gun, whether it's held by a civilian or a cop. But Paul, who is himself a reserve police officer, wants me to understand how it feels to be caught in the heat of the moment with a gun in my hand. So what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, an artificial scenario that is as close to real life as we can get. As a police officer, I walk into disturbances and fights and stuff on a pretty regular basis. There's times that I'll go into that, that scenario where backup is five to seven to ten minutes away, but there's some immediacy that I need to get into the door. That's the scenario that you're walking into today. So we have the shoot house set up. You've got a call from your dispatcher. You're a police officer now. You are going to handle this situation. This gun, in every way, shape, and form, is exactly identical to my on-duty firearm. So the only thing that you have to do is you have to draw the gun and pull the trigger. All right. Front door's cracked open already. You hear voices that are coming from inside. I've no idea what to expect on the other side of this door. Uh, I'm, I'm an officer of the law. How about we calm down, please, what do you gentlemen? Want? I want you to calm down, please. Calm Everyone, down. calm down. This is my house. You're gonna come in here and tell me to calm down. All right. Nobody wants to end up in jail, do they? Get out. So let's just calm down. So just calm down seconds. and mind yourself, okay? Five more seconds. Can we please just calm down? Before I know it, I'm reaching for my gun. I will use you got it. A weapon. Yeah. You know I got a weapon too, mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I shot. All right. Get on the floor. Ceasefire! Ceasefire! Oh, mate, sorry, bruv. You all right? Uh, good, good, good. Okay. You pulled out a knife. Where did Reset. that come from? Whoa. Now, that was just a game, but it shows that when you have to make a quick decision, it's easy to make a bad one. 
but it's still no excuse. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out... 50 years ago, black people in America marched for civil rights, justice and equality. That all men are created equal. And five decades later, mounting incidents of police brutality have politicized a whole new generation and seen the birth of a movement marching under the hashtag Black Lives Matter. But these young people are not just challenging the way the police treat them, they're also demanding the media changes the way African Americans are portrayed. I want you and Fox News to get out of Baltimore City Sorry. because you're not here reporting about the, bo the boarded up homes and the homeless people under MLK. You're not reporting about the poverty levels up and down North Avenue, but you're here for the black riots. We want and they're forcing Americans to confront the uncomfortable truth. Racism still runs deep in America. Since Michael Brown's death, there have been some changes in Ferguson. James, Brian Fletcher and Wesley Bell were sworn in in front of a packed city council chamber. Three out of the six city councillors are now black. There's a new black police chief. I am going to need your help. I am going to ask members of the community to assist me because we cannot do this without you. And a new bill has been passed capping the amount of revenue that the city can collect from traffic violations. But I can't help wondering if something more fundamental needs to change. It's my last night here in Ferguson. I think I found the right place. And I've come to say goodbye to one of the many young activists who found a voice during this momentous year. I can smell the barbecue already. I've definitely picked a good time to turn up. There he is. Hello, hello. Big Clifton, how you doing? Good, Reggie. It's Clifton's high school graduation hey, party. How are you, man? I'm good, man. Did you, wear, you, did you put on a shirt especially for me? Oh, <laughs> you know I mean? And he's soon leaving for university yeah, in yeah, Washington, D.C. to read African-American studies and political science. How you doing? Hello, Taylor. Hook him up with some tunes. <laughs> nice to meet you, DJ Taylor. Come show me your room. I want to see what you look like you. when no one's watching. <laughs> A year after the death of one Ferguson teenager, another one has seen his life change forever. And um, you got an interesting yeah. stack of books. Just Man, to... Stride Toward Freedom. Let's see this. By Martin Luther King. How many times have you read this book? 20. Yeah? 20 times since August 9th. <laughs> since August 9th? Yeah. You know, they, they condemn the riots or whatever, but they have to also understand that Martin Luther King said riots are the language of the unheard. I see us as a new breed. We're just continuing the work, but in a different way. You have to realize during those times when people stood up against uh, slavery, and people judged them all the time. Called them radicals, said they were doing the wrong thing, told them they were breaking the law. But they changed the law. They made it better for everyone else. And I think it's like, when we're out there saying, hands up, don't shoot, it's not just a saying, it's not just a statement. And we're not asking, when we say stop killing us, we're not asking you. It shouldn't even be demanded, right? That should be, uh, should be a given. And what right. do you actually want though? What do I want? I want freedom. I want liberation. I want my little brother to be able to walk down the street without being stopped and racially profiled. That's what I want. I just want freedom. And we're gonna get it.